Hello again, everybody. This is Dan Clouser, and welcome back to the Journey of My Mother's Son podcast. Yeah, I'm joined with one of my former players, Nick Krasinski. Nick, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Dan. It's an honor to be on the show, and I appreciate your time. Absolutely. So th- these are always my most enjoyable podcasts. Um, whenever I get a chance to reconnect with one of my former players and, uh, you know, get them on the show and talk about what they learned through the game of baseball always, uh, you know, makes my, uh, my heart leap in a special way. So we'd gotten together with Nick a few weeks ago when we were in Dallas, um, right after an ice storm and Mm -hmm. we're able to get together and have lunch. And I had been in a, in a habit of, you know, once we get together with one of my players and we were on the road to kind of, take some time and jump in the RV and record a podcast on my phone and, and then uh, put it out there for all the world to hear. Uh, But I kind of changed my philosophy recently. uh, And this is actually the first time I'm doing a podcast with one of my players on zoom like this, because I felt like um, when, when we'd sit down and do a podcast after a a lunch or a dinner, or just getting together to campground, it kind of took away from, you know, the really special time that, that we were able to share and made it more, more of a business meeting at that point than, than truly just getting together and and reminiscing and and sharing memories about our, our time together. So I decided to shift a little bit because, you know, one of the things that's always a theme in this podcast is really living in the moment and taking advantage of, you know, the little things in life. And I felt that by, you know, at the end of a, a visit with one of my players, we get together and, you know, hit record on the phone and do a podcast and it was taken away from that moment. Um, so, you know, I said to, to Nick, Hey, I want to do a podcast with you, but I don't want to do it now. Uh, let's uh, I'll send you a zoom link and we'll, we'll get together. And he was uh, happy enough to, to do it and take time out of his day and, and spend a, another few minutes with his old coach uh, virtually as opposed to in person. So again, Nick, I, I really appreciate you, you taking the time and, you know, before we get started in the conversation, just, you know, introduce yourself to the listeners, you know, who is Nick today in your own words? Nick today, uh, Nick is a persistent young man, um, trying to figure out the adulting world as I've just completed grad school, um, in Florida, moved out to Dallas, uh, in the summertime. So been out, out here about seven, eight months now and didn't know anybody. Didn't know uh, anybody at all. Didn't have any roots planted out here. Just kind of took a chance, a leap of faith, if you uh, might call it that, to move out here and pursue life. And uh, right now, just finding a way to to learn uh, as we go through and really just enjoy everything that's out here and everything that's before me, right? I kind of have a fresh start on life, something that I was looking for and thankful to have uh, met a good community out here, both uh, with friends and have family visiting quite often. So um, that's kind of who Nick is now. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And you know, you're you're one of those guys who really was able to you know kind of spread his wings early in life, um, where you went to a private school. Um, I'm not sure what year you started that, whether it was your freshman or sophomore year of high school. You can kind of you know let let us in on that as we talk here. Um, so you kind of got, you know, out of the house, quote unquote, um, you know, living on site at your school. Uh, and then you went to, to Florida, to the ING Academy, uh, again, on your own and then into college. So, you know, tell me about, you know, kind of getting out of the nest earlier than, than most kids do. How did that, how did that benefit you? And what were some of the challenges to that as well? Yeah, that, that's great, Dan. Um, so in high school, I went to the Hill School, which was a boarding school in Pennsylvania, but I commuted the first three years. So I was still able to live at home. And it really started that senior year when I lived on campus and just being able to be on my own, figure things out, um, take care of myself, not have my parents looking over my shoulder every night, making sure I was doing the things I need to do, just having that responsibility um, at that young age. And then Going down to Florida to IMG Academy right after that, not going straight into college um, to get 
better at baseball, um, get more exposure, and then on to staying in Florida. Of course, once you get down south and are playing down there in that weather, it's hard to want to come back north. So um, stayed in the south. And I think some of the best things that came from that at a young age and leaving home, going so far away, was the growth, the quick growth that I was able to have, right? I kind of talked about the responsibility, um, the leadership that you have to take with yourself um, and understanding no one's here to kind of like watch over you, make sure you're, make sure you're doing the right things. Um, and you learn a lot from mistakes by doing that, right? You're, you'll might get involved with the wrong people. You might get uh, occupied in other activities that aren't like necessarily beneficial for your health and longevity. And um, you learn, you learn along the way and you can learn quickly because you're a product of your environment. So you definitely want to surround yourself with the right people, the right mentors along the way. And I think in pursuing that and, and traveling and going away from home, it really sped up that process for me. Uh, so I think that was a huge benefit. Some of the cons from that, right? You're you're far away from home. So you kind of have to start all over. You have to make new friends, get outside your comfort zone. Thankfully, I, I like to think of myself as an extrovert and outgoing person. So it's easy for me to talk to people, but it's all, like I said, it's kind of also easy to get involved in the wrong areas or with wrong people, with wrong influences and things like that. And you kind of learn along the way. It's like, okay, like, do I really want to associate myself with these people long-term or are they pursuing the same goals I am, whether that's in life, baseball, religion, uh, work, everything. So um, you learn, you learn quickly when you're on your own. Yeah. I love it. I love it. So, um, Going back to your times when, when you played for our organization, for Berkshire Baseball, um, you came with this, uh, your first year was 12 and under or 13 and under? I don't know. It was 12. Remember. Okay. So, um, you know, the way our organization was is obviously we had, um, you know, a bunch of different kids from a bunch of different schools and a bunch of different backgrounds, um, you know, thrown together on you know, on a team and, you know, learn to get to know each other. So coming into our organization as a 12 year old, you know, really not knowing anyone else um, that you were going to be playing with, you know, obviously you, you played in your, uh, you know, local little league program or youth program. Um, and you kind of, you know, were probably kids you hung out with and, you know, you went to school with and that sort of stuff. And now here you are all of a sudden in this new atmosphere um, you know, by yourself, don't know any of your, you know, soon to be teammates. Um, how did that experience help you down the road as you, you know, kind of embarked on getting out of the house and, you know, again, having to, you know, meet new people and, and get to know them. I and mean, what was that experience like, you know, as a very young, you know, young man at that point, you know, one of our first things we, we take a trip to Rehoboth beach and you guys are all, you know, thrown in a, it's called a dorm, but for, you know, for real purposes, it's more like an army barracks. It's just one yeah. big room with, you know, eight bunk beds in it. Um, you know, so right out of the gate, you guys are like thrown into this, like you better figure out how to get along with each other and how to become teammates quickly. Um, and that was one of the reasons why we as an organization scheduled that trip as one of our first, you know, I think it generally fell on our schedule, either our second or third tournament uh, mm -hmm. of our season. So, you know, how did that experience help you um, make those adjustments later in life that we just talked about? I think it shaped me to be a strong leader. I always thought of myself as a leader growing up. I was always kind of in those roles. And I think I think back on those times in Rehoboth Beach, especially when it's just the team, right? There's not, yes, there's supervision from the coaches and the parents, but when you're in those dorms, it's just, it's just you and the teammates. And there's responsibility. And like I said, some people want to goof off, you know, stay up late, do whatever. And it's like, no, we got games at, at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. Like we want to win. We want to play well. So uh, leading by example in that way was, I think, a strong characteristic of me at a young age, just whether it was hard work on and off the field or just trying to lead the clubhouse, lead the team um, in best practices for us to be successful. And I think that carried through down the line uh, wherever I went. It was just, okay, I'm going to lead by example. 
uh, whatever it is, I'm going to, I'm going to figure out the right things to do, how to do them, um, and try and bring people along and just be that, that leader that people can look at that's doing the right things along the way. Um, and hopefully be an encouraging factor to those around me. Yeah. I love it. I love it. So when you talk about leadership, uh, one, one time in, uh, our, you know, my coaching tenure with you, I mean, I really only was your coach for one season. Um, mm-hmm. And to give a little background to the listeners, that was actually a year where um, I coached two teams in the fall. Um, we had a had to make a coaching change uh, at the eleventh hour, and um, you know, I ended up deciding that I would coach both of our fourteen year old teams um, that season. So we literally, you know, I was going to be spending all day at the the field anyway, so it didn't matter to me if I was coaching all day or you know, coaching a little bit and raking fields a little bit, but there was one, one tournament where, uh, you know, the best and the worst case scenario all happened at the same time in which both of our teams, teams I was coaching had a great tournament weekend and found ourselves playing each other in the championship game. And, uh, you know, that presented a dilemma to the coaching staff as to which, you know, which coaches we're going to coach, which team. And, uh, you know, I, I think for me, like both those teams were so special to me. And, you know, I know a lot of people would say, well, which, which team do you enjoy coaching more? Yada, yada, yada. And truly I loved every kid on both those teams. Um, so it put me in a very awkward position to, you know, to have to make a decision as to which dugout I was going to be in for the championship game. So I then decided that as a coaching staff, we just weren't going to be in either dugout and we were going to let you guys play the game and you guys coach each other. We came up with the lineups, obviously. Um, if there was time for a pitching change, you know, we would from the stands kind of relay that, Hey, let's get somebody loose. So it wasn't like it was total mayhem in the dugout with a bunch of 14 year olds, <laughs> but, <laughs> but for the most part, you guys were, were on your own. And, and I kind of remember your face initially um, prior to the game when you came up to me and I, and I know your, your dad thought I'd lost my, my mind as well. Cause he was one of my assistants on, uh, on your team as well. Um, but your face at first was kind of like, what? And then you kind of had this like, okay, all right, we can, we can do this sort of sort of thing, but it was like a first shock and then a, all right. Yeah. Um, and again, I know some of the parents thought I'd lost my mind and, you know, but, but at the end of the day, we as a coaching staff knew that you guys were as capable as, as could be. I mean, it, you, all you were doing is everything that we had taught you to do up until that time anyway. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, again, that game and, you know, in particular and, you know, that initial reaction and then, you know, how you kind of quickly embraced it. Um, and was like, all right, yeah, let's, let's do this. So let's talk a little bit about that. Cause I, I know when I tell that story, a lot of people think that, you know, it was, uh, it was a little bit of out of the box thinking, which yes, it was. <laughs> it, it absolutely was Dan. And I think, I think back on that moment, that initial shock came from, oh my gosh, like, how are we going to put together a team? How are we going to assemble a lineup pitching stuff? But thankfully you guys still took care of that. Uh, which definitely was a little bit of a sigh of relief, but still, we're, you know, we're we're 14 years old, and we're going to have to coach and manage our way through this championship game. Um, and yeah, it's, it just you know it kind of sinks in. It's like, all right, time's going to keep on going. Um, there's no stopping it. That's the decision. That's how we're going to do it. Um, you either go through with it, you know, live by the flame, die by the flame, and embrace the moment. Really, is what it was about. And I think a lot of that comes from, you know, being a catcher, right? I was a catcher for a long time there, especially at Berkshire. And in that position, you're a leader on the field. You're the only position who sees all eight of the other positions on the field. Um, You know, you have that unique vantage point, calling the game, having to call out plays, cut up cutoffs, relays, everything like that. So Naturally, you're going to be a leader. And in that moment on that team, I think was another point in my life at at that young age where I was able to step into those shoes and really lead by example and and help 
help our team win the, or and be in a position to win as best I could, uh, whether that was through encouragement, whether that was through calling the game, whether that was trying to put together a quality at bat and get on base. Um, we knew that as a team, right, we had played together for at least a couple of tournaments by then. And uh, we were a pretty tight knit group, but we knew we could lean on each other um, and rely on each other to get the things done that we needed to do. And that just comes down to communication and the prep and the things that uh, you and the other coaching staff really taught us from the young age and even throughout that season. It's just the real do the little things and everything else will take care of itself. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So let's, you know, you mentioned it. you're, you're a catcher uh, for a large, long part of your career. And again, you're, you know, really as a catcher, I mean, I, I caught when I played um, and as a catcher, you really are, you know, part of the coaching staff and, you know, you and me and, and any catchers, um, you know, there is always a constant dialogue, you know, like I'm not asking my pitcher how he's feeling because he's always going to lie to me and tell me he feels great. <laughs> you know, he could have just given up, you know, three, 400 foot bombs in a row. And I go out there and he's going, Hey, I, I feel good coach. I feel good. Um, so I'm always looking to the, to the catcher to be honest because, you know, you're, you're going to be able to tell me, you know, yeah, he's definitely lost some pop off. It's fastball. His, his breaking ball doesn't have the same bite that it had in the you know first three innings or whatever. So, you know, again, as a young person, you know, taking on that responsibility and, and, you know, having that constant dialogue, you know, how has that helped you, you know, today going into your, you know, professional career? I think it's made me more mature. And I say that a lot, I'm turning 25 here this week. So, you know, had a lot, have a good amount of life ahead of me, but it's definitely have been through a lot along the ways. And I think having that dialogue with the coaching staff, with mentors and things like that, it's prepared me. It's made me more mature in my mindset and how I view things. Um, I'm always forward looking. I'm always honest. And I think when you're a young kid, and you're having that dialogue with your coach and, you know, they're coming to you with genuine questions, wanting to know your opinion. It makes you more comfortable to be honest and to open up to your managers or other coworkers that you're working alongside, right. That might be superior to you, but you kind of view them and they view you on the same level, right? There is no hierarchy. Um, it's just, you know, it's a title, but they're still coming with you with the genuine questions, wanting to know, your answers and opinions on things. And I think it really shaped my mindset there from a young age onward, just to be honest, be mature, um, go about it in a strong way. And I think having those conversations changed me at that young age to be able to have them now, right. Moving forward um, and put me in that position. So. Yeah. Love that. So you know, you touched a little bit on it and I, I mentioned at the beginning, you're actually out in Dallas, Texas now. That's where we got together with you. Um, and I remember a conversation we had during lunch, um, which, which by the way, for, and this is not a paid promotion by any stretch of imagination, but anybody who's ever in the Dallas area or the grapevine, Texas area, if you have a chance to go to Kincaid's burgers, like go no. there and get the, get the onion rings. Uh, a <laughs> friend of ours told us about it. Nick had never heard about it. And he was like, man, this is a place I got to come back to. I'm so close to it. But again, no promotion there at all. That's just a, a shout out um, of an absolutely great lunch <laughs> that we had in Dallas. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I digress. Um, you know, we were talking a little bit about, um, you know, what led you to Dallas and that, that you really felt that it was a calling. Um, you know, talk a little bit about that. Um, and that whole process that that landed you in Dallas, Texas today. Yeah, this is this is something I'm really fired up, always happy to talk about. Um, so in the December of 2020, my dad and I decided let's go see a Cowboys game. Him and I had never been to the stadium down here. We're I was born and raised in Philadelphia as a Cowboys fan, so a little rough growing up. Now it's a little bit better than with my people in Dallas, but uh, we decided to go. We made a long weekend out of it. Went to Fort Worth the stockyards, saw rodeo, all that um, cowboy stuff. But I remember the first day I was here, I looked at my dad and told him, I want to live here. 
And I didn't know really what it was. I don't know why it was at the time. I still had a year and a half left of grad school. And I just felt like it was a calling from God saying, hey, come come live out here. You know, I have something special for you. So over the next year, I was looking at jobs, applied to a couple, got uh, accepted, le- accepted offer letters uh, from a couple and took the chance and moved out here. And it really has been a blessing um, because at that time in my life, coming out of grad school over that past year, um, leading up to moving out here, it, it had been some challenges. Um, I had ended a three-year relationship um, that was pretty serious and it didn't end well. Uh, definitely took a toll on, on my heart and mental well-being at the time. Um, I had just hung up the cleats, right? That was my first year not playing baseball that final year of grad school. So that was a huge emotional decision in the summer before to to not come back and play that fifth year. So a lot of life changes were going on. Um, and I kind of needed a start, a new, a fresh start to, to find new friends, to find people who I could, you know, call, call family away from home and moving out to Texas was the best thing for me. And I was truly blessed to, to meet some quality people from the minute I got here, um, who are a faith minded, and got me plugged into a great church, a great community group. Uh, the work I would do professionally, uh, my coworkers are all great as well. And it really made it feel like home really fast out here. And uh, being away from home the six years prior in Florida, it re- really wasn't any different. Um, I kind of had that experience of, okay, moving away from home and going somewhere new and having to start over and make new friends. So I was used to that. But it still is an adjustment, right? Moving out here the first month, month and a half was, was nerve wracking. Did I make the right decision? I, you know, first real job this far away from home, you know, my own expenses, everything like that. It's all on me to figure out. Um, and it, it was hard at first. It was a little lonely, but with time and everything worked itself out. And I can confidently say um, it was one of the best decisions I ever made to move out here. Yeah, I love that. Well, that one of the things you touched on was um, the adjustment of hanging up the cleats and, you know, yourself, like me when I was younger and played, you know, like every, you know, young American boy who's ever played the game of baseball, like your desire is to, you know, someday, you know, play that game professionally. And at, at some point in our lives, you know, we swallow that pill that, mm-hmm. okay, that's, that's not the way. <laughs> that things are going to work out for me. I'm just not good enough to play at that level. Um, so as, as you were in the process of, uh, you know, just, just talk about that process for you to kind of swallow that pill that, okay. Um, you know, re- real life is my life path, not, you know, not, not the path of being able to play a game and, and get paid for it. Um, what, what was that like for you and how tough was it to, to swallow that pill? I know it's easier for some than others, but what was it like for you? It was certainly challenging. Um, I think any ball player can relate when the day comes, it's hard. Um, but like the money ball quote says, you know, we're all told. Um, some of us were told at 20, some of us were told 40, but uh, we can no, no longer play the child's game. And I had the option to come back the fifth year, um, play through that final year of grad school. With COVID, the previous two years kind of shortening seasons, um, some injuries that came along the way from playing and just looking at my path at life and where I really was going to end up, a realistic path and the dream path. I had a real heart to heart conversation with God and Faith at that time, that year, that final year of me playing, my faith kind of got reignited. And I think that conversation with God in that summertime, okay, am I going to come back this fifth year and play? Am I going to give this one last shot, the dream, right? Chase after it, enjoy that final year. And I think God told me no. I think God told me to pursue some other things that I've always wanted to, but never could because of baseball. And looking back on it, it was the right decision. I think there was so much beauty that came out of not playing. 
Uh, thankfully, I was still able to be a grad assistant coach that last year, so I could still be around the game, which was certainly enjoyable. Um, I'm sure, as you know, going from player to coach, it's an interesting transition, but it's great to kind of mentor, you know, especially since a lot of them were my teammates the previous year, to mentor them, coach them, uh, and see the the game differently from that perspective was was fun. So it, it kept me around the game. It didn't completely remove it, which I think definitely helped make it bittersweet. Um, but yeah, it was certainly hard because, you know, my dad had played minor league baseball. He had always been my inspiration. I wanted to, you know, my dream was always get at least as far as my dad did. Um, and so to come, you know, a step short, uh, obviously hurt, but you know, it, it was, again, it's, it's my life, my dreams. And, you know, him and I talked about it and he was like, I'm so proud of you. Like I never was expecting or, or wanting you to, to pursue that. Right. I want you to pursue what you want to do. Um, and was so thankful for all the memories that him and I shared over the years growing up playing and coaching together. So, yeah, that's cool. So what was, uh, when you first heard about, um, what Sandy and I were going to be doing, um, you know, selling all of our stuff and traveling around in a, in an RV, like what, what was your first, um, internal reaction when, when you heard that the first, first reaction was like, this can't be real. <laughs> it's like, Dan, Dan's not going to coach be around baseball anymore. This guy eats, lives, breathes baseball. He's at the field all the time. Um, you know, as, as you and I talked when you were here in Texas, I mean, that was a huge decision for you. I mean, you're at the field all the time. It's just kind of been your thing for you know a better part of your life. It's just been the game of baseball. Um, and to hear you were stepping away from that was like, wow, that's, uh, that's quite a shock to hear. Um, but at the same time, as I thought about it more and got to see as, uh, your journey progress and at the start and everything, it seemed like kind of in the same way, it was a difficult decision may not have been easy, may have been a little bit of a leap of faith there, but as you go through it, you're, you find a new found happiness, a new found joy and what you're doing now um, that you wouldn't have had the opportunity to do if you would have stuck with baseball. And I think as, as you can attest to traveling the country, seeing people that you used to coach or be friends with all across as you travel um, there's just, you can't put into words, those experiences and the things you've been able to see and be a part of and just be almost like a messenger through this podcast, through your platform, to other people out there to that they're, you know, you can live one dream out and then pursue another one. And you're going to find a whole new different set of, of joy and happiness through that. Yeah. yeah and that, that's so true. And, and it definitely, you know, like you said, with your, your move to Dallas, I mean, for us to do this was certainly a calling as well. And uh, you know, not necessarily one that I embraced at first because, you know, I did love what I, what I did. Um, you know, and you talk about, the amount of time that I did it for, you know, when we made this decision um, at that point, 60% of my life had been dedicated to, you know, the Berkshire baseball and softball club, big vision foundation. Um, so it, it was, it was difficult, you know, but now that we're doing it, um, it's incredible. And to be able to get together with, you know, guys like yourself and the other players that we've been able to connect with um, has been such an incredible blessing to, you know, to see what you guys are doing today as, as young adults um, is really, really special, um, you know, and to kind of see, you know, the seeds that we had planted as an organization um, bloom and come to fruition is, is something that's uh, incredibly special. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the things that, you know, why, you know, God was calling us to do this is because, you know, a lot of times as a, as a youth coach, as a youth administrator, you know, eight out of 10 of the emails that you get, you know, on any given day are complaints, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's, there's many times where, you know, you question, you know, why am I doing this? What, you know, what's the point that this is a waste of time. Nobody appreciates it. Um, but, you know, with us traveling and being able to, to get together and spend some time with you guys, uh, even though it's, you know, only an hour, an hour and a half or two hours um, really shows that, uh, you know, the 
the time that that was put in was was far from wasted without a doubt so um you know i didn't even know where you were at at you know as we started making our trek through um you know through texas and you know thank god your your dad sent me a message like hey i don't know if you know but nick's in dallas um so immediately i you know looked up the number I had for in my phone. I sent it to your dad. I'm like, is this the same number? <laughs> you know, is this number changed? Because <laughs> again, I mean, I had that number since, you know, you were 13, 14 years old, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, he's like, yep, same number. So I shot you a text and, uh, you know, let, let you know that uh, we'd be coming through town. So, you know, what was kind of your, your reaction when you got that, you know, that text message from me? I was excited. I was excited. My, my dad had told me, he was like, Hey, Dan's going through Texas. Um, he reached out or he said, I reached out to him. Um, he said, you know, wanted to make sure it was the same number so you can expect something from him. But I, I was excited. I was excited to see you. It had been, I'm geez, I don't know how long since you and I had last spoken or even gotten together face to face for that matter. So I knew there was a lot to catch up on and, um, you know, I was just overall just excited to see you um, get to share stories, see how life has been for you guys on the road and traveling and enjoying that journey. Um, and just, you know, the different stages that we are in life and how it's progressed for both of us in our own journeys. Uh, it was great to to catch up and, like you said, have a great meal at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And again, just for any of my other old players that are listening out there, you know, I mean, obviously I stay in contact with some more than others, um, you know, just because that's the way life is. Um, but I certainly can't keep track of where everyone is. So, you know, for any of you guys that are out there following me and following our journeys on, on Facebook, like if you see that we're coming, you know, near your area, man, please like reach out, whether it's a Facebook message, whether it's an email through the website. Um, I, I love this. And I'm, I'm so grateful that your dad, had reached out because if we'd have went through Dallas and then, you know, three weeks later, I'd have found out, you know, you were there. I'd have been like, Oh man, we just, we missed an opportunity. So, you know, again, for any of my players that are out there listening, if you, you see that we're going to be in your neighborhood um, in the travels, you know, it doesn't matter when the last time we saw each other, I don't care if it was, you know, two months ago or 20 years ago, like reach out to me. Cause I, I lap, absolutely love, getting together with with you guys um so nick what's one of the the biggest lessons that you feel you learned um whether it was through berkshire baseball specifically or just the game of baseball um that has helped you uh now you know as you're as you said earlier figuring out adulthood i would say it's two parts i would say in berkshire it was learning how to be prepared i think that was the first time I was in some sort of organization where it was very strict on the uniforms. We all had the same bags, um, wood bats, right. Being a new thing, having all that prepared when we go to Rehoboth, um, that like I, we talked about earlier, that's a huge leadership and opportunity as, as young men to, to step up and kind of be on their own in some form of fashion. So just being prepared, each day for each practice. I mean, they were all very structured. The tournaments um, themselves are structured, right? You're playing at a certain time. You get to field for a certain time and making sure you're on time for everything and overall just being prepared to play, uh, I think was, was big at Berkshire and then baseball itself. I mean, there's, there's tons of lessons that you learn in this game um, that I could talk about for hours, but I think the biggest one that sticks with me is how to handle adversity the old, old cliche goes, it means a game of failure, right? You you fail three times out of 10, you're still a Hall of Famer in baseball. And it's the only, only job in the world where you have that success rate. So being able to learn how to deal with mistakes and failing and, you know, going from winning a championship to not even making it into the, the playoffs in a tournament, right, with the same team, Um overcoming injuries, overcoming setbacks. I think the game of baseball teaches you that more than anything uh, in life on how to handle failure and push through that adversity. And I think the big, the biggest tools you have on your tool belt for that are one people 
So your teammates, your coaches, your support group around you, right? When things happen, when they don't go your way, whether it's big or small, whether it's like a broken bat that is brand new during uh, your first game at, uh, or, you know, having a career ending injury. Both of those are, are setbacks, but the people around you help support you. And the second one is, is just your mindset, right? How, how are you prepared to handle adversity when it hits? Because it's going to hit. It happens to everybody at every stage of life. You can't avoid it. Um, setbacks and failures and trauma, it's all going to hit at some point. So you have to just be prepared for when that happens. And I think baseball teaches you, hey, you're you're going to fail a lot. But do you have the mental strength to push through? Do you have the wherewithal in yourself to understand that when this happens, it's not the end of the world. There's always a next play. There's always a next at bat. Um, in life, there's always a next day, right? The sun's still going to come up in the morning. So you can treat each day as a new start in that way. So I think that's the the biggest thing that I take with me uh, from baseball and from Berkshire is the adversity, how to handle that and preparedness in life. Yeah, love it. Love it. Nick, is there anything that we, uh, that we missed that you'd like to talk about before we get to our final question? One thing, one thing that I wanted to mention um, that I thought of before hopping on the podcast with you, I, I'm not sure you probably remember better than me. My dad tells the story a lot and sometimes I forget all the details, but I remember the one game, one tournament, um, pretty sure it was when you and him were both coaching at the same time. And I must have mouthed off or something to my mom or something along those lines. And he told you that I'm, I'm sitting this game and I'm not going to play that. You got to just put me on the bench and, um, you know, see how he handles it or something like that. And you respected it fully, uh, from a parenting standpoint and, um, yeah, I just, I don't know if, if you remember that as well as I do, probably a little bit more of the details, but yeah, I, he tells that story quite a bit. And um, I, I think it was a, looking back on, I mean, it's a great parenting decision, right? I'd probably make the same move now um, because I cheered my butt off for my team because I wanted to be out there. I want to be playing and uh, hurting the team, not being able to, right? So, yeah. No, and that, that's one of the things as an organization that we were we were very strong on is, you know, it wasn't about, you know, our, our chances of winning that game, you know, were much better with you in the lineup than not in the lineup. Mm -hmm. um, but that wasn't what it was about. You know, it was about respect. It was about life lessons. Um, you know, so, yeah, when your, you know, dad had, uh, had brought that up, there was absolutely no resistance um, whatsoever, because that was certainly a life lesson. Um, you know, te teach your mom with her, treat your mom with respect or sit mm -hmm. on the bench. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Pretty much. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, uh, again, that's just one of the things that, you know, that's what our organization was built on. It, it wasn't, you know, uh, it wasn't about just winning at all costs. It was about teaching life lessons through the game. And, you know, a lot of times when we would say that, people would think, you know, oh, well, you guys don't play to win. It's like, no, it's the exact opposite. Like when, when you know, the first pitch is thrown, we're out there to compete. Mm -hmm. um, however, we're not going to compete to a level where we're going to injure a player because, you know, he's out there throwing too many pitcher pitches or, you know, be reckless about it. Like we're, we're going to compete, you know, 110%, um, but we're going to do it uh, the right way as well. So um, it's great that, you know, all these years later, you, you know, you and your dad talk about that, um, that particular lesson as well. So I, I love that. So that, uh, that brings us to our final question. As you know, the subtitle of the podcast is Many Little People in Many Little Places, which comes from the opening lyrics of Michael Fronte's song Gloria, which go, when many little people in many little places do many little things, then the whole world changes. So it's one of the little things that Nick does on a daily basis to make the world a little bit better place. Anytime I'm out in public, I smile and try to say hi to at least one stranger. I think being kind is one of the easiest things to do in this world, especially nowadays when so many people are looking at their phones, they're preoccupied with what's going on in their world. A little bit of kindness um, can make a difference. And I firmly believe 
you never know how big of an impact you might have on one individual throughout your whole life. And something like just walking around with a smile and saying hi to somebody you've never met, ask them how their day's going, could could change their whole future. Uh, something as simple and, and little like that. So that's one thing that I always try to do and just try and be, be that light, be that example um, of just taking the, the light off of me and putting it on others and trying to spread a, a little bit of joy wherever I go. I, I love that. And that is so important. It is definitely one of those little things that, that turns into a, a, r- a real big thing. So you, you never know what that person's battling in that moment. Just a little a high, a little smile, holding the door for them at the grocery store or something um, goes a really long way because, you know, they see that someone else recognizes them as a human being and can go so, so far. So I, I love that answer. I, I love the fact that you do that. And uh, for folks out there listening, be sure to check out my other podcasts and blogs at journeymymotherson.com. While you're there, pick up a copy of one of my books, Journey My Mother's Son, Volume 1, or The Beauty of the Diamond Through the Eyes of the Coach. And uh, got our pre-sale going on for Uke's book as well. You can find that link on the website. Uh, be sure to check that out. And Nick, again, thank you so much. Uh, can't wait for the next time we get through Dallas. We'll get together and have a burger. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Dan. I appreciate it.